where we're going to be this morning, and we are going to continue our series on the climb. And today, we're going to talk a little bit about attitude. Have you ever, have you ever said something to someone like, man, that guy's got an attitude? And what do we usually mean by that? That person's got a poor attitude or a bad attitude. But the reality is, is that we all have an attitude. The question is whether or not that's going to be positive, negative, or apathetic. You know, my kids, um, Piper, she's uh, three years old, going to be turning four on Monday. And then my son, Knox, he'll be turning two in March. They, their dispositions and personalities, obviously, are completely different. And it's really fun. Piper's a little bit more nurturing and assertive. And she likes to tell her baby brother what to do, what not to do. And I love it. I mean, she'll just boss him around and push him around. But what I started doing with the kids is when they ask me a question, I'll go, hmm... Let me think about it. And then I'll say, yes or no. And so my kids are doing that now, and it's absolutely hilarious to watch Piper. I'll ask her to do something, you know, go to her room or go brush her teeth, and she'll go, hmm, let me think. <laughs> and she'll either say yes or no. And, and if she says no, then I've got to tell her again, no, okay, now I'm not asking, you need to go brush your teeth. But usually, Piper's got a pretty good attitude. It's sure, Daddy, sure. Yeah, let me help. I'll do this. Let's go do this. Knox, not going to happen. He goes, hmm, I've been trying to teach him to do his chin, but he won't, for whatever reason, he won't do his chin. He does his nose. He goes, hmm. Atty tink. Nope. That's his favorite phrase. Nope. Doesn't matter what it is. It's nope. If I ask him to get down, mm -mm. Mm -mm. I'm like, man, this kid is going to drive me nuts. He screams at me and yells at me. His attitude is totally different than Piper's. And you kind of know, like when people have a good, positive attitude, right? They're not optimistic, like in the sense like everything is just going to be good. But generally speaking, they have a good, positive attitude. And then there's the negative Nancys of the world, right? Negative attitude, things are all, always wrong, something's always bad. And then the apathetic attitude, I don't really care. Doesn't really matter. Not positive, not negative, just I don't care at all. Well, you know, we as Christians, we do want to strive to have a Christ-like attitude. And if you remember from last week, we talked about how Paul was able to have a divine perspective. And the reason why he was able to have a divine perspective, he was able to see things from God's point of view, is because he prayed and he gave thanks. And if we're going to see things like God sees things, according to Philippians chapter 1, we need to pause and pray and give thanks. And that's what Paul was able to do for the church at Philippi. He's getting ready to address an issue of disunity, but before he does that, he says, look, I am so thankful for you. I love you. When I think about all our times together, it does nothing but bring me joy. And because of that, I can't wait to see you again. But I'm, I'm stuck in a problem. And what was the problem we talked about last week? Paul's in prison. He's in prison for preaching the gospel. In fact, He's going to stand before Caesar himself, the imperial judges maybe, but stand before Caesar himself and plead his case as a Christian. Now, many of us, if we were thrown in prison for our faith, I wonder what kind of attitude that we would have. I wonder what kind of perspective that we would have. Well, Paul's perspective was this, God is at work. Even though I'm in chains, it's actually served to advance and promote the gospel. Good things are happening, and I don't mind these chains so much. And there were even people at Rome that were using Paul's circumstance and situation, he says. They are trying to afflict me. And we talked about how that means to take iron and rub it against the flesh. They wanted to cause Paul pain because he was thrown in prison for being a Christian. They were his brothers and sisters. And you know what Paul said, remember? He said, and I rejoice that Christ is preached. The truth is shared. Even though it's shared with a bad motive, I still rejoice and I give thanks. Having a divine perspective can ultimately lead to a Christ-like attitude. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. You know, if, perspe if perspective asks the question, what kind of situation am I in? What kind of situation am I in? Here's what attitude asks. How am I going to act in this situation? So if you have your Bibles, read along with me, starting in Philippians chapter 1, verse 18. Paul says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. 
Whenever you see something repeated in Scripture, that means there's emphasis there. So Paul's saying, look, even though they're trying to harm me, I rejoice, I rejoice. This is a good thing. Christ has preached. He says in verse 19, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Even though I'm in prison, in other words, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account, you Christians at Philippi. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus, because my coming to you again. Now what is an attitude? I think that's a good question that we should ask. An attitude is a settled way of thinking that reflects your behavior. The Greeks thought of an attitude in the sense of what you set your mind on. That was your attitude. What you set your mind on was your attitude. When Paul wrote throughout the New Testament, he told the Colossians, he said, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Set your mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. In other words, what you set your mind on ultimately determines your behavior. Your attitude ultimately determines your actions. Now, here's what's cool. God wants us to have a divine perspective, not because it changes our circumstances, but because it changes us. It changes our attitude. Our attitudes can change from positive and Christ-like to negative and bad or the reversal. We can become even apathetic in our own attitude. And so I'm not saying that God's going to change your circumstance, even though he's going to change Paul's circumstance. But what God is going to do through a divine perspective is he's going to change you and he's going to change me. And he's going to transform our attitude, hopefully, that it reflects what Paul's dealing with here. Now remember, Paul's in prison, but yet he's joyful. Paul's dealing with Christians who are mistreating him and who are disunified. There's problems in the church, but yet he's thankful. Now why did Paul choose to react this way? Well, here's why. He had a Christ-like attitude. When we talk about attitude, an attitude has three components. There's the cognitive component, what you think, what you believe. There's the emotional component, how things make you feel right? Like a person or an object, certain things you have beliefs about and certain things make you feel a certain way. And then ultimately the behavioral component, how your attitude ultimately influences your behavior. And so here is Paul. What did Paul believe about his circumstance? He believed that God was at work. How did his circumstance make him feel? Joyful, thankful. And ultimately what was Paul's behavior? He wrote a letter of thanksgiving. He wrote a letter of joy The whole theme of Philippians chapter 3, as Paul was writing in prison, is I rejoice and you should too, even though they weren't in prison. And you know, that same thing is true for us. What we believe and how we feel ultimately makes up our attitude. And our attitude is ultimately reflected in how we behave. And here's what's important about our attitude. Our attitude does matter, and here's why. Our attitude communicates our identity and it guides our behavior. And so this year, as we climb our mountain, as we try to tackle our problems or overcome our obstacles, our attitude will truly reflect how we think, how we feel, and ultimately how we behave. Thomas Jefferson said this about attitude. He said, nothing can stop the man with the right mental attitude from achieving his goal, and nothing on earth can help the man with the wrong mental attitude. Nothing can help a person with a bad attitude, just can't do it. And that same thing is true for us. Whether or not you're trying to lose weight, whether or not you're trying to heal emotional hurt, relational hurt, whether or not you're trying to get a better job or a higher uh, paying wage, whether and whatever goal it is, whatever hill or mountain you're climbing this year, attitude truly does make a difference. It made a difference for the Apostle Paul, and it surely will make a difference for us. Now, as I said, there are three different kinds of attitudes people generally can have. There's positive. There's that exudes confidence happiness, sincerity, determination. And then there's a negative attitude. It ignores the good things in life, and it only thinks about how 
one is failing. It's angry and doubtful and frustrated. And then, of course, the apathetic attitude. There's no hope. There's no doubt. Problems in life are ignored. You're lazy and unemotional. You never feel changed because you simply don't care. Now, what was Paul's dominating attitude in Philippians chapter 1? Well, I think it was positive. I think it was Christ-like, and here's why. In verse 18, we already read it. He says, look, I rejoice, and again, I rejoice. Despite the hardship that he was going through, Paul's behavior ultimately was one of joy and thanksgiving and positive. It's not overly optimistic. He's not ignoring his chains. He's viewing his chains through a divine perspective that ultimately expresses itself through the light of joy. Now, let me ask you this. If you were thrown in prison tomorrow for preaching Christ, what kind of attitude would you have about your circumstance? What would be your attitude about your situation? Would you be able to see things from a divine perspective? I know that I would struggle with that. Would you be able to have joy and thanksgiving and see God on the move at work in your own circumstance? I think the majority of us would probably say, why me? God, if you love me so much, why would you let me go through this? Because we've got the wrong perspective. Remember, what we believe and how we feel makes up our attitude, and our attitude is expressed in how we behave. What was Paul's behavior? It was joy. Look what he says in verse 19. He says, I know. This phrase, I know, means to be confident because you've examined the evidence. He says, I know that this circumstance will work out for my deliverance. I'm going to be set free, in other words. When I go before Caesar himself or an imperial judge, I know that my deliverance is going to come about. I have confidence because I've examined the evidence. What was the evidence that he examined? Well, here's the first line of evidence. Through your prayers, he says, look, I know things are going to work out because you're praying for me. Prayer changes things. We should be praying for each other. We should be telling each other, that we're praying for each other, and making sure that we're actually praying for each other. It was such an encouragement to the Apostle Paul to hear from the church at Philippi, and they said, look, Paul, we are praying for you, and we know that God is on the move. We know that God is at work. We're praying for you. And Paul says, look, that gives me confidence because you're praying for me. But then also, evidence number two, he says, the help of the Spirit of Christ Jesus. This word help comes from the idea to have a fully paid amount to produce a play or something on a theater. So in the ancient times, they used this word help to say, look, we have all the provisions that we need to make the play successful. And here's what Paul was saying. I've got everything I need from Christ to bring about my deliverance. Do you know you have the same spirit that Paul had? The same spirit that gave Paul the confidence the same spirit that gave Paul the power is the same spirit that lives in you. And if we are going to be a person that conquers our fears or overcomes our challenges this year, we have to have the same kind of attitude that Paul shows and demonstrates right here. We should pray for each other with joy and thanksgiving. And then we should also know that God's spirit lives in us. And he is working God's ultimate good through us. Now, interestingly enough, Paul's going to be thrown in prison again, and church history tells us that Paul was ultimately beheaded for his faith in Christ, but he's going to be released from prison in this case, and Paul knows that God is on the move. His work is not done yet. You know, Christ promised his apostles, he promised his disciples that they were going to be persecuted, they were going to be thrown in jail, they were going to stand before governors and imperial judges and magistrates, and they were going to be put on trial. But God says, look, Jesus says, look, I'm going to give you my spirit, and he's going to teach you what to say. You're not going to have to recall. He will tell you what you're going to have to say in that time of trouble. Now, here's the good news. He did that for the apostles. Here's the bad news that doesn't apply to us. <laughs> We've got to put in the hard work of our salvation. We've got to read scripture and study and pray and reform our character with what the Bible has to say about certain subjects and certain ideas. God is not going to zap you with instant knowledge. He did that with the apostles. He's not going to do that with us. We've got to learn the hard way. We have to study. We have to pray. We have to read our Bibles. We have to do devotionals. We have to memorize scripture. We have to put in the hard work if God's going to refine our character. You know, Paul had a positive attitude about a situation because he believed in the power of prayer and he believed in the power of God. And here's my question for you. Do you believe in the power of prayer? Do you believe in the power of God? 
Instead of approaching maybe your problem with weight through the perspective of diet and exercise, even though that's definitely a foundation, maybe you should add on the power of prayer. Maybe you should petition God to give you the moral strength to overcome your sin of gluttony. Or maybe you've got relational issues and you struggle with pride and envy and jealousy. And instead of just going to therapy or medicating yourself, maybe you should approach it through the power of prayer and through the power of the Spirit and ask God to be at work in you. You see, it's not an either or. It's not medication or prayer. It's medication and prayer. It's not exercise or prayer. It's exercise and prayer. The spiritual component to overcoming our mountains in life is so very important. It's the foundation of who we are. It was the foundation for who Paul was. You know, I was reading about uh, an Austrian neurologist. He was a psychiatrist. He was also thrown in a concentration camp during Nazi Germany. His name was Viktor Frankl, and he was eventually released from prison, and he said this about his circumstance, being in a concentration camp, starving to death. He said, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's way. Look, Paul had a choice. He chose to react a certain way. We have a choice too. That's one of the great things about the Holy Spirit is it gives us the moral power to choose. With our own work and with the Spirit's work, we can choose an attitude just like Victor and just like Paul. Victor also said this, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. And so this year in 2020, you may not change your circumstance. You may work the same job and have the same relationships and struggle with the same things, but you have the power to choose differently. And God has given you that power and he's given you that ability. Look what Paul goes on to say in verse 20. He says, it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame. He's hopeful. He's not just joyful. He's not just prayerful. He's not just thankful, but he has an attitude that expresses itself in hope. He says, I have an earnest expectation. This literally means to concentrate and fix your gaze on one single point. To remove everything else and to look and fix your gaze on one single point. That's it. What was Paul fixing his gaze on? What are we fixing our gaze on? Here's the first thing that Paul has removed. He's removed everything else, and he says, here's what I'm concentrating on. Here's the one silver bullet that I'm working towards. I will not be put to shame in anything. He says, look, I'm not going to be silenced. If I go and I stand before Caesar and I preach the gospel and I defend Christianity both intellectually and morally, I will not be put to shame. God's on the move. But if he sentenced me to death and I die... I'm not going to be put to shame either because I'm not going to deny my faith. Here's my one single focus is to honor Christ. That's the direction that I'm headed. That's what I'm looking at. That's what I'm moving forward on. You know, we should honor Christ with our bodies, with our attitudes, with our relationships, with our mindset, our ideals, our morals, our work ethic. We should want to honor Christ in everything that we do. That's what Paul says, I'm fixing my gaze on honoring Christ. Look what he goes on to say in verse 20. He says, but with boldness, Christ shall be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. Here's here's the other thing he's fixing his gaze on, courage in speech. I'm not going to be afraid to share the gospel. I'm not going to back down. I am going to stand before Caesar himself and boldly proclaim the truth of Christ. I'm going to honor God with my body and life or death, and I'm going to boldly proclaim the truth of Jesus. And I think that we should do that same thing. You see, Paul has a determined attitude about his life for Christ. And here's the reality. If we never reach a moment of determination, we will never overcome our obstacles or our challenges. I like what Bible commentator uh, Richard Melick had to write. He says, the commitments which drove Paul in his life now kept him as he contemplated his death. Christ was committed to Paul's salvation, and Paul was committed to Christ's honor. And so when Paul was alive, it carried him through. And right before he faced death, it carried him through. 
You see, below all of our goals, below all of our objectives, below everything that we want to accomplish this year, below our happiness is ultimately our attitude, what we're fixing our gaze upon, what we're concentrating on. And for Paul, it was honoring Christ no matter what. And I think that you'll discover when Christ is the foundation of who you are, everything tends to fall in line when you tend to honor Christ. It deals with the problem of gluttony. It deals with marriage stress. It deals with work ethic because you're seeking to honor God in everything that you do. And when God is number one in our lives, everything else will fall in line, just like for the Apostle Paul. Paul says, look, I'm going to see to it that my body is used in such a way that bring Christ's honor, whether I live or whether I die. Paul's not only committed to the hope of this future release, but look what also he says. I'm committed to the confidence in my future ministry. He says in verse 21, for to me, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He says, look, I'm in a win-win situation, baby. If I live, I get to go on preaching Christ. If I die, I get to go be with Christ. So I'm either going to serve him and live for him, or I'm going to die and I'm going to be with him. Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, we are always of good courage. He says, we're not in fear. We overcome our fear with courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Win-win situation. I am courageous because I'm following Jesus in my life. And I am courageous because if I do die, I'll finally be home. I'll finally be home. You know, I've sat at the bedside of people who are dying, and they've reached such a point in their life, despite having everything else to live for, their bodies have just decayed so much that they're ready to go home. And that's where Paul's reached. He says, look, I've, I've lived a good life. He's, he's around 60 years old at this time. He has lived a productive ministry, 30 years preaching and proclaiming the gospel, but Paul has this attitude. There's still more work to do, and I'm willing to do it. But man, if I get to leave this world, I'll be at home with the Lord. That was his attitude. Win-win situation. You know, like Aladdin, if Paul were to die, he would be entering a whole new world. I'd sing it for you, but that, that would make me really embarrassed. <laughs> and he'd be like, loser! <laughs> uh, did you guys see Aladdin? Yeah, the, new, the remake? I actually prefer the cartoon better, uh, just because I think that uh, I just like Robin Williams more. Like, he was the man of my childhood. So funny. But, uh, but it was a whole new world for Paul. Serving, loving God, being in the presence of the Lord, being with family and friends. You know, Stephen, one of the first martyrs that Paul oversaw as a Jewish zealot. He oversaw the stoning of Stephen. Stephen. He, was, he was sentenced to death. They threw rocks at him until he died. And Paul was one of the main uh, protagonists in that. And he converted to Christianity. Can you imagine what Paul was looking forward to sharing with Stephen? Seeing his brother in the Lord. He was actually primarily responsible for his death. And he says, man, I, I can't wait to go see Stephen again. I'm going to be with Christ. I'm going to be with the Lord. And I'll get to share with Stephen and apologize and repent and reunite with him. And I think for those of us who have lost loved ones, I think you really do know this feeling of wanting to reunite with those who you've lost. And that's how Paul feels about Christ. To live is to work for the Lord, but to die is to gain. Look what he goes on to say in verse 22. He says, if I am to live in the flesh... That means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose, I cannot tell. He says, man, if I'm alive, it means kingdom work. But man, I just, I don't know what I'd rather choose. I know what's probably going to happen. I'm pretty confident I'm going to be delivered. But man, it just is so appealing to be home with Jesus. But at the same time, I get to still do kingdom work. He even goes on to say in verse 23, I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ for that is far better. You know, I thought about this scripture and I kind of felt a little guilty because I'm not ready to die. I've got a life yet to be lived. I've got kids to raise. I've got people to love. I've got kingdom work to do. Paul has lived a long life of ministry and he's ready to go home and be with the Lord. But I got to be honest with you, I know it would be a great gain, but I'm not ready for that yet. And I don't really, bad, I don't really feel bad for feeling that way either. I've talked to young adults before, and they're like, man, you know, yes, if the Lord Jesus comes back, that's great. But man, I want to have a family. I want to get married. I want to enjoy all the things that life has to offer. And that's good. 
You know God wants you to enjoy this life more than you do? You know God created this life for us to enjoy? And Paul has reached the end of his ministry where he has finally reached the destination of, look, I've lived a successful ministry and a fruitful life, and if I die, it is my gain. It is better. But if I live, there's still more work to do. And I think that's a really good attitude. But I think that we would err if we gave up on what this life has to offer. There are so many good things to enjoy, people to love, food to eat, places to go, things to see. We have a life to enjoy, and we should enjoy that, while at the same time understanding that to be with Christ is much better. It is much better. He says, look, I am hard-pressed on every side. Here's what this word meant. They use this word hard-pressed to like, you ever been out on, made the decision, the bad decision to go out on Black Friday? And you go into a store and you've made it halfway and you're like, I should probably go back. I really don't know if I want to go through with this while at the same time you're like, well, I did come out after all to get these things. And so you're kind of hard pressed and you've got to squeeze through the people, you know, and you're throwing elbows along the way to try to protect your personal space. Well, that's the idea of what it means to be hard pressed. I mean, the walls are closing in. They actually had these valleys, these pathways where it was so narrow, you actually walked through and it would, the, the walls would brush your shoulders because you were hard pressed on either side. And so you only had one of two options, to go forward or to turn around and to go back. And that's where Paul's at. He's like, look, if I go forward and I live, that means ministry. That means loving you and seeing you again. Or if I die, I get to be with Jesus. I'm confident in what will happen, but it is certainly alluring to go home and be with the Lord. That's where Paul's at. And you know what? As you go about this year, don't lose that perspective on eternity. Don't lose that perspective. This life isn't all there is to offer. There is a whole lot more, and it will be so much better and so much more glorious, and it will last forever. It's not going to end, and it's going to be good. And so even though this year may be good or bad, even though you may conquer or you may fail, even though you may have good times or bad times, there is something far much more glorious to be enjoyed and celebrated and embraced. Paul put it like this, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. He said again, to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. He he told Timothy, look, when I die, this was right before he was actually murdered. He says, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will award me and to all who have loved his appearing. There is more to be enjoyed. And so appreciate the process. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the climb. Embrace it while at the same time looking at the eternal perspective. You know, Timothy, I actually like to think Timothy liked to work out. He liked to exercise his body. Paul wrote to Timothy. He says, look, bodily exercise is important, but also more important is spiritual exercise, is godliness. In fact, he kind of puts it like this, bodily exercise without godliness is really of no value. It's good to train our bodies and to get in shape. It's good to accomplish our goals, but if we fail to have the future reward, the divine perspective that there is more, we've missed it. Jesus put it like this, you can gain the whole world and lose your soul, and that is of no value. You've missed it. You've missed it. And so here's Paul's encouragement. Don't miss it. He goes on to say in verse 24, to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. His other prospect is to be here and to minister. Being convinced of this, he says in verse 25, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and your joy and the faith. He says, look, I'm going to see you guys again. I am in prison in Rome. You've sent me help. You're praying for me. You're loving me. And I know God will deliver me and I'll get to see you again. And he did. He actually was released from prison. Him and Timothy went and saw Philippi again and maybe even twice. And he reunited with them and preached the gospel to them, and shared in the joy of their faith again. He says in verse 26, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming again. And that's good news. He got out of prison. He was released. And so here are the three things that I want to end with, that if you could take away anything from this text, here's the first thing. 
I see that the church was praying for Paul so that he would be delivered from prison and speak boldly the gospel. And so here's my encouragement to you. As you go about your climb this year, who are you praying for? Who are you praying for? There are people who are in prison, both literally and metaphorically. There are people who feel trapped in life. Is there somebody that you could pray for? Even more importantly, is there somebody that you could pray for and then let them know, I'm praying for you? Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he says, Rejoice always and pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God and Christ Jesus for you. If you've ever asked yourself the question, God, what is your will for my life? Right here, pray always and give thanks. If you're not praying for anyone, maybe take a moment and say, you know what? I'm going to pray for this person every day this year. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to let them know that I'm praying for them. I'm going to text or email or call or or whatever, FaceTime, and say, look, I just want to let you know I'm praying for you. I love you. I'm here for you. I am in your corner. It's one of the greatest things that you can do as a Christian is to pray and let people know you're praying for them. The other thing that I'd like to take away is this. Paul used his privileges and his freedoms to advance the gospel. The church at Philippi used their freedom to support Paul, to love him, to serve him. And we have even more privileges than they did. We have even more freedom than what Paul did. I mean, he, after all, was in prison. And he's using that opportunity as not only just as a Roman citizen, but as a Christian to preach the gospel, to serve others, to love others. That's exactly what Philippi has done. They were the only church in Macedonia to give financial aid to Paul. And he noted that time and time again. He actually told the church at Corinth, the Philippians have given out of their poverty. They're not rich like we are. They're not wealthy like we are. They gave out of nothing, out of poverty, because they loved Paul. They served Paul. They sent their most trusted and lovable preacher, Epaphroditus, to Paul to love him and support him in his ministry. And so here's my challenge to you. Who are you praying for? And then also, who can you serve? Who can you serve? Not out of much, but out of what you do have. You don't have to have a whole lot. You just got to be faithful with what you got. Paul told the Galatians this, he says, you are called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And your attitude will reflect that. So who can you pray for? Who can you serve? Who can you give towards? Who can you spend time with? Who who can you help fix their home? Who can you help pick up or drop off? Who can you serve? There was a noted English architect named Christopher Wren He was supervising a construction of a really incredible cathedral in London, and a journalist thought it would be interesting to interview some of the workers that were stationed there. And um, he walked up to three of them, and he asked them, hey, what are you doing? And the first one replied, I'm cutting stone for 10 shillings a day. What are you doing? Well, I'm cutting stone, and I'm going to get paid. The second one said, I'm putting in 10 hours a day on this job. That's what I'm doing. I'm working, and then I'm going home. Here's what the third said. I'm helping Sir Christopher Wren construct one of London's greatest cathedrals. It's all about perspective. Perspective changes attitude. Attitude is reflected in behavior. Yeah, you may be going to a job or you could be working for the Lord. Yeah, you may be working on your relationships or you could be honoring Christ with what you say and what you do. Yeah, maybe you could be losing weight and getting in shape and having confidence Or you could be honoring God with your body. It's all about perspective. It's all about attitude. Are you building a cathedral? Are you doing kingdom work this year? Or is your gaze fixed on yourself? You see, what ultimately made the difference for Paul is he wasn't selfish. He wasn't ego-centered in his life. He was Christ-centered. And that was the foundation that changed his perception and his attitude. And it can change yours. Ultimately, Paul recognized that his climb to preach the gospel was useless without helping others ascend their climb. And maybe that's the trick. Maybe it isn't you losing weight this year. Maybe it's you losing weight as you help somebody else lose weight. Maybe it's not financial freedom for you, but maybe it's helping others have financial freedom as you get financial freedom. Maybe it's not growing closer with Christ for you. Maybe it's growing closer with Christ for you as you help other people grow closer to Christ. 
After all, we'll see in the upcoming weeks, Paul wrote this in Philippians chapter 2, let each one of you look not only out to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. And so if you can just envision yourself ascending a mountain, you've got your gear, you're climbing up, you're passing everyone along the way, and maybe that's not the right way to go about it. Maybe the right way to go about it is to look to the person to your left or to your right and say, let's climb together. Let's pray for each other. Let's serve one another. And let's look out for the interest of others. After all, Paul said, it is better to be with Christ, but it's a better benefit to you that I would work in the ministry and see you again. And I know that's the right choice. And so that's my encouragement to you. Who can you pray for? Who can you encourage? Who can you serve? And who can you help this year?